You're listening to Journey for Truth with internationally known medium, Tai Yi practitioner, and radio host, Tammy Urbanic. Hello and welcome to Journey for Truth on iHeartRadio and YouTube. I'm Tammy Urbanic. Thank you so much for joining me. Journey for Truth Radio is always on demand and with many new episodes. If you go to journeyfortruthradio.com, you can sign up for the free newsletter where you will receive notification of new episodes. And also the episodes will be on that website as well with all of the links necessary for iHeartRadio and YouTube. On JonahLifeInstitute.com, there is a new message called Toxic. This is a message that can be downloaded, and it does talk about toxic food, toxic water, but it also talks about toxic relationships and a toxic environment energetically, and what a person can really do about that and how it can impact you consciously, unconsciously, and subconsciously, and how being in a toxic environment and or relationship really moves you in the opposite direction of finding your joy and your passion. So JonahLifeInstitute.com is where you can download, order that message. My guest this week is Kenji Gallo. Gallo, is that correct? Gallo. 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 Thank you. Kenji was in an organized crime for over 20 years. Uh, That also included working with the mafia for eight years. He wore a wire for the FBI for those eight years and has been outspoken about his time with the mafia and his life now. Kenji, welcome. Hi, right, thank you. Glad to be on. It's great to have you on the show. How did you enter into organized crime? Uh, I started when I was about 13 years old. I got a job at a restaurant and I really um, just idolized the guys they, that owned the restaurant. I looked up to them and my first thought was I'd like to be like them. And they uh, kind of mentored me in organized crime. I started uh, dealing drugs, cocaine, and um, they happened to be in Southern California, and that's, I just kept moving on up, so. Why, what was it about them that you idolized? Um, just the way that, well, when they had money, and they just didn't, didn't care about the rules, and uh, they kind of out, operated outside of it, they had respect, um, I remember he, the guy Joe pulled up, in his, and he had a new Cadillac, and he had that silk shirt on, silk pants, and a gold watch, and the chain hanging down. And he pulled up and he, in the parking lot and uh, walked up, and he shook my hand. And I remember thinking, that's who I want to be with. And then the more I found out about them, the more I, I just started to – I really wanted to be like them. And I felt like that was my where I was going to be. That was my path. And uh, so it consumed every day of my life, basically. As you grew older, what were you expected to do with the mafia? Um, the thing that, that people don't understand and, and TV doesn't show you is you never get paid. You, you have to provide, you have to always produce money and, and constantly do things. It's, it's a, it's like a, like a group. And, uh, you, you have to, you have to, like, I had to constantly come up with, you have to do whatever you're told. You can never, like, if you're, if you're back when we, when we didn't have, we didn't even have cell phones, we had, uh, pay phones we'd have to wait by pay phones or wait at home until we got a call and then they would just tell us someone would just tell me what to do where to show up um when we got pagers uh if i was on the freeway in traffic no matter what there's no excuse i had to get off make that call within five minutes wow. and um yeah no matter where i was so you always had to carry change and there's no excuse you uh, the thing is like you can never come up with an excuse i can never say like you know i was sleeping i was late it doesn't matter they don't care and so the pressure's on and I did I mean I did every every single thing that they told me because you you can't when you're in it you have, in order to be around that group you have to do what they say so if someone says hey go go uh go bust this guy up then, then, then you got to do it it doesn't matter if it's your friend or it's not your friend because if you don't do it they're going to get someone to get you and that's the end of that so so you d- you mentioned earlier that you didn't get paid how did you survive monetarily um, because, you know, there's, there's tons because they open doors for you and <clears throat> like my, my, um, they opened the door for me, but I got, I got involved with some very large, uh, cocaine traffickers. Um, some of the people with the Medellin cartel and the lady they called, uh, Griselda Blanco, which is, they made a movie about her called cocaine cowboys. And, um, they provided me with all the cocaine at wholesale price. And I was, I would move that. And then I also was a transported for them and i got paid low and then once i had that money i started i wanted to be in gambling and so a guy taught me 
how to take action to to make you know, have a sports book. And I was like a, his apprentice for a couple of years, and and I got paid for that because you know I worked with him. But then I started my own, and pretty soon that 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 pretty much lasted me for twenty years. Uh, that particular in industry, the gambling. Now, was or is human trafficking involved with the mafia, or is it primarily drugs and gambling? Um, the mafia is pr primary, like even drugs, or they say they don't do it, but they do. Um, it's primarily it's pro it's primarily putting up the money for the drugs. They flood the country with it, and gambling, uh, 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 pornography uh, was a staple. I was involved with that um, for years, and um, human trafficking not so much. Um, strippers and strip bars that which is close to it because but those the the girls that are at the strip bars like I saw ones from Russia and, and different j different Eastern European countries and they're they're pretty much owned by whoever brings them over and um, life because they have to they earn those money the guys take it and they live in these houses together and they're scared to leave and they can't really leave because they're illegal mm -hmm. and they don't they don't really speak English you know and, and once in a while a girl gets away but um, even the, in the porno, I mean, like I, I tell everyone all the time, I tell girls, they always, they always refer to like, oh, well, Jenna Jameson. I go, well, I know Jenna and she's, it's not a happy ending. There's no happy endings in, in, in organized crime or porn or any of that, that lifestyle. There's none. And, uh, I see how the guys would lure people, the girls in, they would, uh, it would start with a girl, a pretty girl would come to California usually because they want to be an actress mm -hmm. and ve very few actresses or actors can even make pay rent. Very few. The ones you see on TV or there's maybe a handful that could actually, you know, pay their bills. The rest have to have menial jobs. And so these girls come in with these dreams and they come, then they answer some ad for like a figure model. They start doing bikini shots and then they, pretty soon the guy says, hey, take your top off. You can make more money. And then everything becomes easy because that you're in that lifestyle. Everyone around you is doing the same thing. So they break down your barriers. And then it's like, well, you should just take your bottoms off. Then it's like, you should be with the guy. And Hey, and then your the money dries up and then you can, then you, Hey, but you could do porn. Mm -hmm. No one is going to know. But the thing is this, it's forever. And that, and that's the problem. And that, that, that's even how organized crime operates anyway, because everyone around you is into, into crime. So it's normal. Like to me, everyone being arrested, being out on bail, like from age 13, until 37 years old, I was either uh, incarcerated, out on bail, on parole or probation, um, nonstop. The, the longest period of time I was ever off was when I was 28 years old. I was off for three months. And, they, and the feds already had an indictment against me. I just didn't know it yet. Wow, that's amazing. Now, you mentioned uh, the porn industry, and you briefly yeah. mentioned it again just a moment ago. What has yeah. been your experience in the porn industry? Um, well, I mean, I have extensive experience. I was in it since, uh, cause the mob controlled it in the early eighties. And, um, I worked for the people who made deep throat and all the big movies. Uh, I sold it. I, uh, directed it. I shot it. I produced it. I paid for it. I was on the sets where we paid cash. Um, like I said, there's just, there's, it's not a, not pretty. It's not, a, it's not good. It's not, um, those people who are real and, and they're, and they're victims. And, um, even though they're getting paid to do it and they mm -hmm. think that the, the girls, the, the people don't understand, like the girls, they, they get paid pennies and they don't understand it's forever. Once you, once you're in, you can never have a good life because now, especially now someone could just look it up on the internet and they're going to find it when you get married, you know, you're going to try to find some guy, you want to change your life, but they think they're really young. So they, they think this money is like everything and, and it means everything like a new Louis Vuitton purse or a new Chanel bag. But it, really what it means is nothing. It's uh, they're selling their body and their souls for just like very little bits of money. And uh, so I was in it from the, the distribution to the making I approved artwork. I know every single step that those people take to do that. And that industry was like one of the hardest for me to, to digest. I couldn't really take it. I hated it um, because the people in there were just so ignorant and I just couldn't. And there's there's just no happy ending to there. There's none. And I used to travel. At the, at the end, I traveled around 38 weeks um, a year to all strip clubs um, all over the United States with the feature girls, the bigger girls. And I would see it and I could close my eyes because I would be in the back room and I would be there for a week or two, depending on who it was. And I would close my eyes and listen to the girls talk. And it was always the same story. They are all from broken homes. They needed a father figure. They're looking for approval of a man. And 
it was just just too much after a while. I just couldn't take it. I just listened to it over and over, and it's the same thing. And it's not happening. Those girls will never get out of that cycle. And they do it. Usually they do it while they're young and pretty. And then right. when they get old, if they can't get out, that's when they go to prostitution, drugs, and then they hit the wall and they, they pretty much OD and die or, or drink themselves. To death. And that's what I've heard. I've heard that um, pornography, for the most part, the women that are participating in pornography have been usually sexually traumatized or they've been abandoned. There's usually some core issue going on there that leads them to... Well, they're they're selling their bodies in order to survive um, financially, and and I agree with you that it's it can be very very difficult to have a happy outcome. There has to be a massive change. There has to be a significant massive change within the woman to decide that she wants something different, and that takes a lot of work. And when you're already caught up in that industry, who's going to be there to guide you? to create that change. Now, when you were working in the porn industry, this was when you were still in organized crime, correct? Correct. Well, we controlled it. The mob controlled the distribution of it. And I would handle it for guys from back east, from uh, from different families. I would handle their deal and I would do my own. And then I, I controlled uh, parts of the web, you know, webcams and things like that. And, and that brought us money. And I can tell you this, 100%, every single girl that I met came from a broken home and mm. missed, did not have a, dad, a father present. I never met one girl that had a, a strong father figure, not one. Yeah. So that out of, out of all of them, Playboy, Playmate, Penthouse Girl, Model, every single one of them. Wow. So wow. All- Se- serious, uh, seriously significant uh, in terms of our society and yeah. and how we just we, – we kind of just throw women around and, and use their bodies. And – it's not completely all victim because many women choose that industry. And so there is a level of responsibility there. But everyone needs to take a level of responsibility in terms of how they see women and, and how they treat them, whether it's directly or indirectly. Well, the, the problem is that our society puts so much on material things like, mm-hmm. like the purses. And then the women think and they think that this is glamour. They glamorize this kind of like, look at. Kim Kardashian is basically a porno star. Same, same with uh, Paris Hilton. I mean, that's and they glamorize this. I mean, like Kim Kardashian's mom is is uh, Chris Jenner is on the set when she's doing Playboy. I mean, like really seriously. Mm. And and the the problem is that guys watch this and they don't understand that that is not real life. Right. And and they just and they fall into this thing. And the women aren't like that. But the women, you're right. They're not. Vic, they're not. It's not Vic. You know they it's not just people taking advantage of them. They actually do it themselves because they fall into the trap of the quick buck. Right. You know, they can't get out and they can't get out of the cycle of like getting up late and doing this and just having their, their so-called freedom, which it's not. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just really, it's really tough. And the only way that anyone could ever get out of it is they have to change the way they think and, and get out and understand. And look, I, I was in this, this lifestyle and where this was good. I had porn shops. I own two. I mean, I can tell you, I made a ton of money off it and I was addicted to the money and I was addicted to the, to the, just the way, the power of doing things. And until you're willing to walk away and, and change your life and do nothing, then you're always going to be the same. Like I, I always used to, I used to get arrested, be locked up or be out of parole. And I would say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to quit. And, like, and, and then like one day I commit 48 felonies. And exactly. Then, well, that money, it, it is when you're addicted to money, like you stated, yeah. it, it's like being addicted to a substance or, you know, a drug or an alcohol or anything. It just, it just controls you. It, it almost suffocates you. Yeah. That's 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 the reason why I wore a, why I agreed to wear the wire for the FBI. I was wanting to get out. I was thinking like, how how am I ever going to leave? And you you go into life, you go out dead, and you just you can't leave. You just can't quit. And so, uh, they had left a message at someone else's house for me, a card. I ended up calling them, and all they could offer me, they said, we only thing we're going to give you is a fresh start. From the very beginning, you can start over again. That's it from the day. And I said, well, how long is it going to take? And they said six months to a year. And it ended up taking eight years I wore a wire for them. But see, wow. I couldn't just I couldn't just leave because I would always have that open door to go back. I needed to throw a hand grenade over that bridge. I just burned that bridge. I needed to get rid of it. And well, And it took me, 
I spent 18 months in witness protection by myself in Idaho in a, in a, in a safe house, really a hotel room, a suite, for 18 months alone with no car, no ID, basically a, a nameless person. And I, I, during that time, I, I ate, uh, you know, ate, out, ate, ate, ate right, worked out, trained myself, and just got my head clear. And it was like leaving, it was like, it was like decompressing from a drug. It was like, it was so, that was my whole identity was being a mobster and being in that life. I had to decompress and change every way I ever thought about everything. And it took, that was in 2005. And after that, I took two more years and I spent in Spain and I wrote my book. And um, even that, like writing my book was like, it helped me come out with like, think so many things about myself. And even after that, it's been honestly till, till 2014 until you know until I you know, like I really I, be, I became a Christian and I really started analyzing my life mm-hmm. that I really was past that but it's like I had PTSD from what I did I can so. imagine and and yeah. you answered my question my next question was what made you decide to wear a wire was it and just to go further into that answer was it something that happened or was it what you were uh, implying earlier that it was just Day after day, it was building that you were deciding you no longer wanted to be in the industry. You no longer wanted to be an organized crime at all. Or was there a specific event that said, I'm done? No, it was, it, it just kept building up, building up because I was constantly involved. It's a 24 hour day job. You could have, and, and a lot of my old friends had died, had died, had been killed off and, and were gone. And let, some of them were incarcerated for life. And I just didn't have that feeling and then I started to see also that it was a big lie it's not all about honor and everything else like a couple of times I was locked up everyone stole the things I had on the street when I got mm-hmm. out I came back I had to work I had to hustle and and, the, and then the, the feds were just constantly on me they were just wearing me down I mean they have they have unlimited resources and time to go after us they had a squad that just went after us so constantly being watched and I could never talk I could never say anything in a car or to anyone else I had to constantly be and it was just too much and so I was like you were done Look, just after yeah, this building. Yeah. And I was like looking for an out. I was looking for something. And so when I, I went to this deli and, and there was two FBI agents waiting and waiting in front, I thought I was going to prison again. Like, cause I already had one case and I figured, Oh, well I'm going. So I wore two, uh, two pairs of sweats, two pairs of socks, uh, a, a couple of a sweatshirt and another shirt underneath with no string and then slip on shoes. Cause I figured I was going away. I brought $20 with me. And then they said, Hey, um, do you have a gun on you or anything? And I said, no weapons. They're like, can we check you? And they're like, yeah, you, they're like, you don't have a cell phone. And I go, no. And they're like, look, don't freak out. You're going to go inside, but you're not going to be arrested. We're not here to arrest you. We just want to talk to you. And then one guy was in front of me. One guy was in back and we walked into this deli and we turned and went to this private room and there was eight other agents in there. And I went, <gasps> cause I recognized some of them, obviously they arrested me. And then they're like, like relax, relax, relax. We're not gonna take. We're not gonna arrest you. We just want to talk to you. And then and I sat down. And this is where they asked you to wear minutes, a wire. Yeah, they asked me if I. They told me that look, we can. You can change your life. They, the one guy said something to me. He said, "Look, we watch you all the time. We watch you. We watch you basically grow up. We watch you since you're 18 years old, and uh, we know everything you do. You've been arrested so many times, and you work like crazy. You don't drink. You don't go out. You don't do anything. You don't take drugs. You're up early." Do you, do you realize that if you would have worked at McDonald's or worked as a garbage man somewhere, you would already be a multimillionaire by now from all the hard work <laughs> you do? So you're just wasting your time. And so that that was kind of something that hit home. And then once they mm-hmm. said, they give me a fresh start, they asked me if I wanted to learn. And I go, no, guilt. he's quit. He's going to, I'll be dead. So I just agreed to it right there in one second. So. That's amazing. Now, did you have a lot of fear? that once you wear the wire, well, two questions. Did you have a lot of fear when you were wearing the wire that the other people within your crime unit, let's say, would notice you're wearing a wire? That's my first question. Okay, well, I had no fear about the wire at all. Um, there's no way they would have saw it. It was inside my Rolex watch. Mm. Um, and it was a, it's a, it was a, it's not like on TV. It's a, it's a tiny MP3 player. It lasted, one lasted for nine hours. The other was lasted for 13 hours. They had two watches made, mine, and then another one exactly like it. So we'd switch them out. And then I had a belt buckle with it, one in, and you couldn't even see it. You just, it had no moving parts. So all you do is you, you had a little paper clip and I press a tiny indentation, not even a button, an indentation. And I could feel a firm click. And once it's on, it never, I cannot turn it off. Oh, so wow. it would run. 
continuously. And then I had, um, once in a while I'd have another one, but I carried my wad of money and there's no one in the street is ever going to touch your money. No one's, no one's ever going to like frisk you because that's, I mean, at that point, if you don't, that's an ultimate insult. And, you know, we have big problems if that's the point. Um, they had my car wired up. Uh, I had another thing. I'd press a button that was inside the seat. You, there was no outside button, and it was an MP3 player. It would roll video and uh, and tape. So I had no fear of that, but I did get into a lot of situations where I thought I was going to be killed. I thought my number was up, and uh, I had to let it play out because if I ran or didn't do it, I had to act like I was still on the street, like no matter what, I'm still a criminal. So I had to show up and do it. And they all obviously they turned out because I'm still here. But at the time, I thought that I was going to be killed. Now, you wore the wire for eight years. And was it then that you went to go testify? Yeah. And were you afraid after you had to testify? Were you afraid that then they were going to come after you? Well, I didn't I didn't have to testify. I only testified at grand jury and the wire that I made. Um, like about 900, I think, um, hours of, of tape. Mm-hmm. Every, everyone, everyone ended up pleading out. In fact, um, last year was the last, they had one more girl that was holding out and they, and they have one more person that's ready to be sentenced for it still. Like it's been over 10 years. Wow. Um, they're still using, they're still using it to arrest people. Um, I think, I think I got it over like over 30, 30 people arrested and taken down and maybe more. And, um, they all played out because the feds, once they hit you with the big charge, they hit you with racketeering and everything. Your your best shot. It's not like TV. Your best shot and your only shot is to plead out. Um, the tapes I have, it's 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 usually the person you know speaking. No one's baiting them. They're just speaking. Then they had wiretaps on top of that. Other video evidence. You're you're not getting out of it because you can you can pretend like you didn't do anything, but when you play it for a jury, they're listening to it. You're done. So, but um, after I was done. Like I said, I lived in in witness protection for a while, and then I went to Spain for two years. And then, um, see, I I know that once the damage is done, there's no there's no point in in hurting a federal witness because if you do, you're going they're going to destroy your organization. And so that would be that would be one of the fears that I would have that. Uh, you know, I've I've spilled the beans. I have essentially told on the people that I was working with. You know, what would stop them from coming after me two years from now, three years from now, when I perhaps would not suspect it, but you're stating that they, it would be so obvious if they did anything to you because you were a federal witness. Right. I'm a protected federal witness still, but also you have to remember that I was in that life the, that whole time. That that was my life. I was exactly the same as they are. I know their little games. I know their little tricks. And I'm not just going to sit here and let them do it. I still watch my my myself. It's not like on TV. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of work to actually set up a hit. It takes like um, maybe six to eight people. Some, you know, um, you have a shooter. You have a backup shooter. You might have another shooter. You have a person with a crash car. You have a person with a walkie-talkie. I mean, it, it's a big ordeal. And um, when I was living in California, Los Angeles, good luck. I mean, I would see any guy from Brooklyn coming. Mm. And um, that was my life. It was my life. And but the more the more TV and the more stuff I did when I lived in California, um, the less chance I had of of them doing anything because it's unlike TV. They're not going to they don't want that. It's a secret organization and they don't need that kind of problem from me. So now you were like you stayed in California and you have left the state of California. What are you doing yeah. now? Well, now I live on a farm. Um I take care of animals. I train. Uh, I used to train when I was in California. I was just a, I was a writer for TV, and then I trained actors, actors and actresses, and and world champions how to uh, fight, like box, kickbox, and and do MMA. And then uh, I left California over a year ago, and I came here to the Midwest. Um, I work on. A, I work. I live on a farm. I work. I have animals. I do that. Um, I and go you around. Help I, people with Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah I was gonna. I, I speak at churches, but also I started a Parkinson's program called a, I saw a thing on 60 minutes called rock steady boxing. So I went and I got certified with them. I already know I'm a certified trainer. I already know how to train anyway. How does but that help? Because it helps with their motor skills. It helps. I help with their balance. Like I always teach fighters how to get balanced, how to move around, how to be stronger. I make people stronger. Well, it works for Parkinson's too. It's, it keeps them for their hands from like turning down and from shaking so much. And it, it I mean, it really helps. Like I've been training 
one person now for five months that has Parkinson's and it's when I got there, he used to shuffle when he walked. Now he can he can do in in and out of uh, the ladder. I mean, he can do things like he can sit on a, a Bosu ball and move around. Wow. I mean, he, he I mean he has incredible balance. And then just on a whim, I started training some of his older friends, people that are about seventy, and the lady that's about seventy. And there's nothing wrong with them; they're just older. Mm-hmm. And you should see them. It's uh, pretty incredible. They're they've they've gotten their cardio up and they have ultimate balance because you know like a lot of a lot of when you get old part of it is the falls that right you know, exactly and you lose balance well I've, I've got them all like really doing balance and I teach them how to fall how to if they start to feel dizzy like how to get down into a fighting stance and then how to get back up that so. I love that I love that because you know exercise is so powerful it's so powerful to our brain as you were mentioning our physical body our motor skills our balance as you were talking about and not only helping um, people who are younger in their training and their boxing and their skill, but also working with people with Parkinson's and just, uh, you know, older people who don't have Parkinson's, but also need help in regaining their balance and their stability. That's awesome. Now, you also have a strong mission with youth. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, well, like, I'm trying to, like, I go around and I speak, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you. Like, everyone... I've noticed in, in churches, everyone goes around and they, the first thing they say is, well, I'm going to go to Africa. Or I'm going to go to Haiti. I'm going to do this. I think we need to have people here in the United mm-hmm. States because we need to help people. And everyone's the next thing everyone says is I'm going to go to the inner city. Well, look, I'm going to go right around here, right around my community. I'm going to go to the people that are middle, you know, from the middle class people that every most people ignore. Those kids, those are at risk. The ones that are at home drinking when the two parents are working, that kind of thing. I can help them. And so like. So that's why I'm going to start uh, volunteering at the Christian Youth Center, everything. And that's all. My, that, that's when I go around and speak. I go to celebrate recoveries and I talk to them and I say, look, you can think whatever you want. But I was at the top of the game. There's no one higher than where you're ever going to meet that was like this, like me. And there's no winners. There's no happy endings and there's nothing in this life. You have a chance right now. Your slate is clean and you can do it. And so. I'm I'm thinking about actually starting a youth boxing program just to help out. So and I just, think that would be wonderful. Yeah, in in LA, I did a a, a youth MMA for a, um, at a low income MMA gym, mm-hmm. and I I started. I said, look, I'll do one class a week. And the first day I showed up, there was 40 people there. Wow. And uh, I'm like, well, okay, we'll split into two classes that night. <laughs> and then the people were like, can you help us? You know, do this, and the, you want to do this. And so I said, okay, I will. I'll come on Friday. So I came on my Friday evening. And then since I taught movie stars and stuff, I started using them. I would shame them into coming. You know what I mean? Like, hey, these kids want to meet you and just come down. And it's an hour out of your day. Big deal. And then they would come down. And so I, I started doing that. And uh, a lot of the kids, they stayed in school. And one guy went into the Navy, went out, went, went out for the Navy SEALs. I mean, this is like it really helped them because they wouldn't get in trouble. It gives them a, a, it gives them, it gives you know, them an more. outlet. It gives yeah. them a, a, a space to, to really express themselves in a way that they want to express themselves, where it's safe, right. where there's a teacher, where there's guidance, you know, where there's not drugs and alcohol or a lot of yeah. other uh, negative peer influence. And I just, I think that's awesome. I'm a, I, I love exercise. I love the fact that you're teaching MMA uh, to youth uh, specifically and to older individuals. Now, what do you want the listeners to take away from today's show? Because you you have gone from like polar opposites, from organized crime, porn industry, to well, way over here, working with youth, working with people with Parkinson's disease, really being a fantastic teacher. Um, what I want to tell people is that it's never too late to change. Like no matter how old you are, no matter how far you think you've gone, you can always redeem yourself. I mean, you can change. Do you have a chance? Anyone has a chance to change the course of their life. It's not, it's not the situation. Like I used to think like I was the luckiest human being in the world because like I would just go through really I, just because I just didn't care. And like, I didn't care what happened to me. But now I realize that it's not how, not what happens to you. It's how you react to those situations. And exactly. I think that you, we can all change wherever we are. And 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 by be like you know exercising by having a good a good good outlook every single every single morning I get up and I write these I write these little motivational quotes I put them on Facebook I put them on Instagram I put them on my blog Better Live Lives I put them on um, uh, everything and I have hundreds of people that read them like them and write into me and like once in a while I'll get the one person that say look 
that day when you wrote this, that was like directed at me. And it, it, it helped me. It pulled me from the edge or it just, it just really hit me where it counted. So that I can affect that me, that I can actually do something good. I'm actually known now for not doing bad things, which is what my whole life was about. Mm-hmm. But people actually thank me. It's, it, you know, it, that's fulfilling to me. And, and like, if you do what you love, the money's going to come. Like, exactly. when I, you know, I, mean, I don't have to worry about it. Like when I was in LA, um, I just, I, I was really, I was caught up in the acting and in the, in the writing stuff and I made good money, but it was when I started training the kids and everyone else that I felt like, you know, now this means something. The other one's just getting money. Mm-hmm. And so when I came here and I started training people and, uh, I don't need as much money cause I'm in the country. I mean, I just, I just don't. And it's provided it, it, everything that I need is provided for. And the more is coming and people come and I can help people. Even, and I tell people all the time, like, they're like, Oh, I just can't afford it. I'm like, well, just come. Awesome. Because, well, where because can someone people... taught me mm-hmm. for free. I was going to say someone taught me for free. And I think that this shouldn't be just a rich people sport. Right. It should be for everybody. And and if you really look at martial arts, they're all made for peasants anyway to defend themselves. So we have to like, I have to give back and because I'm a black belt in jujitsu and I, I want to give back. I can't, I can. And people are like, you're crazy. You can make this, but who cares? Exactly. I, I love that philosophy. We need money. We, we, we need money in order to purchase food, pay our rent, pay our mortgage and so forth. But it doesn't have to be the center of our lives. We have so many other things that can be the center of our, of our lives. And it, it is, comes down to purpose. It comes down to our own personal spirituality, our own personal growth, healing, and our relationship with humanity. And I, I feel that's what it really comes down to. Yep. Now, where can I, people find your blog and your book? Okay, my book is available uh, on Amazon. It's called Break Shot, A Life in the 21st Century American Mafia. Um, I have a KinjiGallo.com, and that's that's that book. That's my old life. And then I have Better Lived Lives blog, which is my new one, which I write. I put out a new one every week. It's like a Christian, more geared towards spirituality and stuff. And um, every day I'm on Instagram for Better Lived Lives. And uh, we'll be, I'm coming out with a new book uh, in 2000, this next month, you know, probably January of 2017. It's a Christian theme and about just changing your life and, and, doing, and doing more stuff. So it's, it's editing right now. I'm working on it. So. Excellent. Well, thank you, Kenji, for being a guest on my show this week. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you, listeners, for joining me here as well on Journey for Truth on iHeartRadio and YouTube. Until next time, have a fantastic week.